All right, everybody, we're going to be getting started here in just one minute. Welcome to, uh, hey, everybody, we're going to get started in just one minute. I wanted to let you know this is the time of year where we're dealing with um, the uh, hurry up and wait and the craziness of everybody having other committees because apparently there's this big day on Tuesday called Crossover Day. So if you'll give us just one more minute and make sure we have all parties here and then I can, we'll get started, okay? And uh, a little housekeeping while we, before we get started, I, I am uh, Will Wade. I am not the chairman or the vice chairman, but I am filling in for both the chairman and vice chairman until vice chairman Irwin will be here later. I think he is presenting a bill in another committee and will be here uh, forthwith. So anyway, let me see if we have all that. All right, so let's see what order we have. All right, everybody, I'm going to go ahead and call our full education committee meeting on March 9th to order. And we are going to take up and discuss four bills today. Um, for sure, there is a possible fifth that Chairman Dubnik and Vice Chairman Irwin have asked me to consider. And that bill sponsor is in the process of getting copies um, to all of the committee members. Um, but it depends on what time it is and that that representative understands that they may or may not make the cut um i remember playing some sports teams and sometimes if you're late you don't get to play so but i will try to be friendly to that peer of ours so first what we're going to start out with is house bill 1184 and just a couple of reminders for folks um i don't want to be a broken record but there may be somebody new in the room uh, Chairman Dubnik always allows for public testimony during our subcommittee process. Um, and in the full education committee, we reserve that time for presentation by our bill sponsors and anybody that the bill sponsor wants to bring potentially as a um, uh, reference to any specific policy or utilization of alleged counsel, as well as open it up for questions and comments from the committee members. So that's the process for full committee. Hope everybody understands that. We welcome public input. I would also say if you as a person have not had an opportunity to share your thoughts or concerns or ideas, please feel free to contact the bill sponsor after the meeting. I know all of us as representatives are always willing to discuss policy and our bills to alleviate concerns. So don't forget about that very important step in the legislative process. So. With that, I do want to ask a friend who is, doesn't even know I'm going to call on him, <laughs> but I'm going to ask Dwayne Hill if he would open us up in prayer. Let us pray. Our dear, kind, and gracious Heavenly Fathers, we come to you with humble hearts, seeking your guidance, your wisdom, and forgiveness of our sins. We ask, Lord, that the decisions that uh, we have to make would be pleasing to thee, and it would help our constituents. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you've given us, the country that we live in, the state that we have to live in. And we pray for those in the Ukraine, Lord, that you'd watch over them. And Lord, you know what needs to be done there, and we just ask your will be done. Again, thank you, Lord, for your blessings, for another beautiful day you've made for us. 
And we ask this and all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that, Representative Hill. Thank you so much. All right. So first, we're going to start with House Bill 1184. And we are going to have the esteemed Al Williams come and present to us. And I, sir, want to let you know, you have far more than 10 seconds to present your bill. <laughs> you are wherever you feel comfortable, sir. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I will make sure that the chairman understands your desire and you have my favorable consideration. <laughs> Thank you very kindly, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I bring to you House Bill 1184, LC 4907-27. And for your consideration today, it's in subcommittee, basically what this, this, this bill does, and I have a gentleman here, Michael O'Sullivan, who, who is an expert in this field, who would offer some insight. But basically what it does, it takes the current SAT and ATC and moves it from being administered on Saturday morning at some place and asks that it be done at the school that the person who's taking it attends. Now, we found particularly in the rule, it can be tough for transportation, <clears throat> excuse me, based on where the test is held. I said in subcommittee, uh, Chairman Smith said that over in Columbus, he has students that have to go to LaGrange to take the test. And so this would eliminate that and it would have the state get involved to the point of paying for the test. It is very easy to forget that there are a lot of students, potential students out there, college students who, who is, Financially, they're just financially challenged. And, and a lot of times from single parent families on fixed incomes, and it's very, very difficult. This moves it in as the state take care of the cost that is involved. And this includes charter schools and the juvenile justice school system. There were two recommendations made in subcommittee, Representative Benton had some reservations about the number of times you take the test. Representative Benton and I got together and, and, and recommending that there be at least three times taken and we kind of put the ceiling at three tests. Now, you know, you pay for it, you take it as many times as you can afford to take it. Uh, this cuts it at three with the state involved and Tim Butnick and Irwin, Representative Irwin and I talked and we'd like to add in this bill also, there is a opt-in feature. You can decide whether you're in or you're out. And of course, one of the things that happens, we give the local school system uh, the decision. If the school board and the superintendent decide they wanna leave it like it is and they don't want to bring it to the individual schools, they can opt in. And, but the most important thing is the students have the opportunity to opt in. Taking a test can be pressure, a lot of pressure. And a lot of folk, I said in subcommittee, I probably could have endowed a chair and saved money when I sent my oldest son to college because he had a great time in two years, but he didn't get many credits for his time. And, and I think dad pushed him a whole lot harder to go to school than he wanted to be pushed. He chose another career. Last year was six figures. So I don't know who's smarter, me or him, but it looks like he's doing all right to me. But uh, this is the bill in, in, in a snapshot and it's relatively simple, but it could mean a lot to a whole lot of students in Georgia. And with that, I'd like for uh, Michael, if he would expound upon it, done some studies and we're, we're going to be brief because you have a lot to do and this is a short time to do it. So if you would not mind, let's, let's take the 20 cent tour. Hi there, I'm Michael Sullivan with uh, organization Georgia Can. Uh, we've got a, a report that we did a couple of years ago on, on this issue. Uh, it, this isn't new ground for uh, 
for many states. In fact, Georgia itself, the state already pays to have all 10th graders take the PSAT. So we prepare them for the for the SAT or ACT, but we don't actually give them up an opportunity to take it. So this closes the, the gap a little bit. One thing I, I might just kind of mention, uh, college isn't for everybody, and we know that, but there are too many students out there who believe or think or have been told all their life that they're not college material. And the ability of offering this exam in school, let them get a score that they can see where they are, let them receive college letters and, and things that come along with it. Colleges send out you know, to people who have taken the test, uh, flyers, that could get people to think, you know, perhaps this is for me. And so leave it up to them to decide what they want, but give them an informed decision, give them a heads up. Um, you know, this is a, a good bill that is proven to uh, reduce inequality with um, college applications and college enrollment, particularly among low-income students. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, got two questions so far. Before we do that, um, I'm going to ask a quick question. So, Representative Williams, I have read your bill. I want to make sure I'm reading it correctly or to, con to determine did you get with legislative council? Do y'all have the opt in in this, or are we going to need to consider we're, we're that as need an to amendment? Consider it as an amendment. Okay, per, yes. I just want to make uh -huh. sure I, I didn't see it mm -hmm. per se. But what's that? Okay. Okay. Yes, both of those have to be. If okay. It, if it's All right. Well, what I'll do is I'm going to open up the questions um, while we're doing some questions. After we get that, if you would like a few minutes, have you had any time, Legislative Council, to consider that language? At this moment, I am beginning to consider that language. <laughs> <laughs> I love crossover Eve process. That's good. Okay, that's fine. At least we're all on the same page. Uh, and, and I appreciate the, the bill sponsor for working with that. So let's do these questions then I think we can have some consideration. So we're all clear on what the, mm -hmm. you know, the amendment would be with two components to that amendment. So one of the things I would like to say sure. is that these amendments literally yesterday, ah. it was an event and I got together and like about two and a half hours ago, Representative and I got together after he read it and he was the things that he had some concerns about. Okay. And, and, and I thought, both the recommendations were good, okay. so uh, would have had a little more time. No, no, that's fine, and I'm okay. I'm I'm amenable to the potential of an amendment uh, if the if the committee is is comfortable. With that. Let's let's go ahead and do our questions. I'm going to start with twenty two. All right, yes, sir. Good. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> before I start the question, of the, of, or before, yeah, do I understand that there'll be an amendment? Allowing the schools to opt in. Yes. So that's not going to be mandatory. It's not going to be mandatory. It was, it was originally, and that was one of the recommendations. <clears throat> now, and, and this is where it gets a little dicey. The, the student and opt in. And as I thought about it, and I mentioned it, the school district will, will have the option because, you know, in some urban areas, might be close enough, but they might not want to change. The, the place where they're sending most of their students might be reasonably distant. In, in rural areas, it's going to be different. As I know, my students, some of my students travel over 50 miles to take it. So, so that becomes much more important. So I, I'm thinking that if we leave it more, the opt-in to include the school and the student. So in other words, the, the committee, the amendment or committee sub would say that it's <clears throat> the school system could opt in and or the student can opt in. Yes. Okay, so if the school system decides not to opt in, then there is no choice for the student. Am yeah. I correct? Yeah, the student becomes a loser. Okay, well, and, the, and yeah. let me explain the reason. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
south of my district is Baker County. And they had, I guess a year or two ago, 12 seniors in their entire senior class. Uh, and for a school system that small, it would be a bit of a challenge if let's say only five of the 12 decided to take it. So that's where I was coming from. The, the, my, my question now is you said during school, school hours, yes. okay. And would this be taking away from the instructional time? Well, I have found that when we say taking away from instructional time, we've got a lot of things a lot less important than the SAT that, you know, for years and years, man, they used to let our school out the whole day to go to Coastal Empire Fair, you know. But it, 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 I don't think it will because it cumulates your instructional time to see where you are. Because this, this is really a part, the only thing it does, it, it removes you having to, Saturday mornings might sound easy to some of us, but it's not easy for all parents to take four hours out of Saturday morning and drive 40 or 50 miles to take the test. And I don't know about the instructional time piece because there are many things. It's a, I think it's kind of based on a, a, a case by case business uh, basis. If the school system agrees that you know it's taking away from instructional time and up in and up out, but I'm, I'm I wonder how much instructional time does it take away from because you're really gauging where you are on what you've done on the instructional time and how much it has helped a student and where a student is because, you know, a lot of students who have the potential to score real well, never score because they never end up being incentivized to go ahead and take the SAT. I was listening this morning to a case of a young man who had miserable high school grades. And at the time when, when, when he was 1600, he did 1400 on SAT. 1400. So he, he wasn't losing the quality time. It's quite, he, he was showing them that I've learned a whole lot more than y'all thought I did based on your grading scores. Well, it's been my experience that the SATs, PSATs take about a half a day. About four hours is what yeah. they usually take. Okay. About four okay. hours. And, um, the state average is not 1400. Mm -hmm. So we would be taking away instructional time from the people that perhaps need it the most. Um, but I'm going to also add one more thing. Several years ago, the, the legislature under Sonny Perdue changed the uh, mechanism for, for instructional time mm -hmm. from days to hours. Mm -hmm. If a school decided to opt in, and have the SAT on a Saturday anyway, that could be a possibility because it's, it, as I said, they don't measure the instructional time by days mm -hmm. anymore, 180 days, they measure it by hours. Mm -hmm. And those were just my thoughts. Thank okay. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'm gonna say this just, and then I'm gonna go, we've got two questions. Um, I did not realize Speaker Pro Tim Jones has a question online and then number 15, who's 15? Okay, then Representative Carter will be after that. Um, one of the other things is your bill, I want to make sure it's clear the way I read it. Um, you're not removing the flexibility of a school to determine if they decide to opt in, if we get to that point. We're not. No. That it, it will not be prescriptive as to a specific day, specific hour. They will have an opportunity to design that within there so that a school system would be able to continue to maximize mm -hmm. instructional time and then pick a day that would be during the normal school week, but not, not necessarily in conflict with it. So that flexibility would remain, correct? Yes, it okay. would under the All right, thank you. Let's uh, go to Speaker Pro Tem, Jan Jones, and tell me what I need to. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just, I just had a few comments. I really just saw the bill. And I do think this is a, a very large policy question here. Uh, years ago, Last time I looked at um, SAT scores for Georgia and the number of students that took it, we were an outlier in terms of having one of the highest percentages of students taking the SAT. And as a result, 
you know, when you have more people doing something, the average test score was low. And people used to ask, why is George's average SAT score so low? And they didn't really think of what was behind it. it if it would lead to more students going to college, I guess I would be, um, you know, I would find it a welcome change. What I have a concern about is, one, if, if it occurs during school hours, um, I, I think it would take away from instructional time because you have the students who would choose not to take it. You got to figure out something to do with them while you have the students taking it. It also, you're going to have students taking it that um, may never have even taken a single college prep class, may be reading well below uh, the average. And are we misleading them and thinking, you know, maybe the, it's a bigger issue for them to complete high school and to work on increasing their academic performance. Additionally, I, I do think it, it sort of suggests to kids all over the state that we're picking college versus um, technical college right out of high school. And we know from the dropout rate, uh, Representative Williams, we have an enormously high dropout rate at our colleges around the state. There are several of our state colleges that have a completion rate of one third, 30%, 35% in six years. And, and I think we've done those students a disservice because many of them weren't prepared for college. I remember when during the Great Recession, we reduced the amount of funding for, for AP courses and that I really hated doing that. I'd probably rather take this money and pay for more kids to take AP courses. Uh, you know, have the state fund that. And I don't have a problem with the state funding the SAT for anyone who, you know, meets a certain low income criteria, because I want to give students opportunities. I just wonder if this is the right message or should we be encouraging, you know, more that they take more rigor by, you know, like I said, paying for their, S, their more AP classes. Um, I think the intentions are well intended. And I think I, I suspect there's a good compromise to be found. It sounds like you're already working on some of that, but in general, um, I do, I just have some concerns in general. I'll just, I'll mention that just some things for y'all to think about as you make changes to the bill. And then I'll, you know, I'm happy with whatever's the will of the committee. Thank you. Let, let me, right. well, Thank Mr. You. Chairman, before the next respond. question, I'd like to respond to that. Sure. Michael, I'd like to you and then okay. there's some time for so uh, for one of the points, uh, particularly the two last questions, uh, Atlanta Public Schools, uh, uh, maybe two years ago, began this program of offering during school, during the school day, all students have the ability to take the SAT or ACT, I can't, can't remember which. That was done through private donations for a, a few years. Um, what APS actually did was they created a, a college day where you know, freshmen did some sort of counseling, sophomores did the PSAT, juniors did uh, the, the SAT, seniors did college applications and FAFSA, and they just made a day, you know, half day out of it to, to get it all, all done at once. Uh, so overall, you would, you would have seen uh, more engagement uh, enrollment. As for the, the scores, there, there's actually an argument to be made that offering this, well, that it was very true that a few years ago, Georgia had the highest or one of the highest participation rates. That is less true now, mainly because 25-ish other states have now done a universal SAT or ACT, so their numbers are are higher than us, their participation numbers are higher than us. At the same time, offering it as a junior will in some ways uh, increase individual scores because a situation that you have right now is, is students waiting until the last minute to take a qualifying score. They, they might wanna to go to college, decide to go, decide that the school that they want to go to re requires a, a score, so they'll go and take it. And that's the only test that they take. And as you'll see, the more times you take a test, particularly this one, your, your scores will increase. 
And so taking it as a junior offers you a, a, a baseline to know this is where I currently stand. Perhaps I've got the ability to take it again and score higher rather than wait until the last minute. That's the only score you, you get. That's the only chance that you have. You might miss whatever you know, cutoff score that you have. So there's a lot of benefits that, that come because of that. And, and you know, in terms of an overall cost, uh, you know, particularly if you're offering it as, as a you know, wide bunch, you're, you're able to actually uh, recoup some savings. Okay, all right. Uh, Can I have a follow-up question, uh, Mr. Chairman? Sure, real quick. Comment. So yeah, so to, I appreciate some of, much of what you just said, and, and, but to the point that, you know, City of Atlanta or Atlanta Public Schools pays for it now, and whether or not it's through donations, they certainly have a high enough tax digest to pay for it out of their tax dollars, the highest in the state. But um, we already have thousands of students every year that pay for it. Why would the state assume something that is already being paid for by many parents who certainly have the resources, why not at least define it down? And I'm not saying it has to be free or reduced lunch, but some level that so that we're not, you know, times are good now, but, you know, we've been here when they weren't. And so at least narrow it up to students that, um, you know, might have a harder time affording it versus those that can. Thank you for my, uh, Representative Carter. I agree with that, by the way. Ahead, Representative Paul. Carter, you, uh, yep. You, do I need, oh, am I? I think you're good, yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, Representative Williams, I think you addressed my original concern because I think now you're saying that it's going to be um, optional. And, I, and I, when, once Ledge Council has the language, we'll be clear about that. But when I'm a little thrown off by some of the comments, um, when you're saying optional, you're referring to it being optional providing it during the school day and not necessarily mandating that all 11th graders take the um, exam? Yeah, the, the primary emphasis here is, is on the school day. We'll be taking that. It's, it's not mandating it, it, changing it to that degree, but to give you the opportunity to do it during school hours. Okay, that, that's what I thought you were doing. Uh -huh. and, and my concern originally was, I thought everyone was gonna be mandated on the school day, but, um, and I hear you very clearly that communities that have to travel a long distance, it becomes a burden on families. So I get why you wanted to have it offered on a school day. And, and as I reflected on it, I, I, I almost believe that when I was in school, some time ago, we uh, we did it during the school day. So I think we're going back to what we used to do. But I also like the idea that we're going to add the language of having the option because, you know, for those students that are like in dual enrollment or something like that, that aren't in school during the day, they will still have that option. So um, so I feel a little bit better now than when we when you presented it last week. But I absolutely hear your heart and concern about those communities that don't have access and having that option really helps them. So thank you for bringing this bill. Thank you, Representative Carter. Um, so just want to clarify for the folks that may not have a copy of it. on line 23, it does confirm coming from line 22 students yeah. enrolled in grade 11 who choose to participate choose so to participate. It would not Absolutely. be a mandate that's good um I, I want to i'm gonna go to 17 then i'll come back to my thoughts so okay. 17 is that Misha? okay representative Maynard. yes thank you um i like the bill you know i represent a mm -hmm. urban area but my family is rural so montezuma byronville georgia so i completely understand what it's like in those communities. Um, so since with all the comments that people are saying, you know, maybe it could be for the purpose of getting it passed through is maybe we could make it income-based. Um, we could also just do it for rural communities for now, since urban communities, you know, have more access to transportation or even, if it's in a rural area, and I'm just throwing out some suggestions, if it's in a rural area, maybe the state could pay for transportation for several of the schools within an area to go to a certain place. And another suggestion would be 
you know, um, Speaker Pro Tem Jones mentioned everybody may not go to college and everybody may not be interested in taking this exam, but someone definitely that has a B average or above and they have income restrictions um, should be afforded the opportunity to take the SAT. And then just the point about the AP exams, you know, the AP exams, they cost $100 a piece. Um, My daughter is taking five AP exams right now. And so, you know, that is a cost burden to especially someone that is intellectual, but if they had some income restraints. So I'm all for that as well. And those are just my suggestions. Okay. I appreciate your suggestions. So um, you'll see me up here looking around a lot. So I've got an eight-year-old and a two-year-old, and I've gotten really, really good at like handling lots of thoughts and distractions at one time. So I was listening clearly, and you you actually brought me to an an idea and a thought that I want to propose initially um, to the bill sponsor. Um, And because I have a desire to see if we can take the input that we've received and come up with something that is meaningful, because I like what you're trying to do. Okay. As a former school board member and of a rural community that's now, I guess, sort of half rural rural and half suburban. Um, One of the things that I think would be important to know are the number of schools that would want to participate and and utilizing folks like GSBA, GSSA to get that data. So here is an idea that I have, and this is literally on the fly based on communication. Um, Accomplish the opt-in for schools that want to do it the opt-in for students that would like to do it, but not tackle the funding piece of this yet without actual input, but go ahead and open up the door to allow the schools to choose to be a testing site and make that as an option. Because what that does do immediately allows the schools to avail themselves during the school day, the ability to be a place where those students can more easily take the test should they choose to take the test but still currently have to pay for it because that's currently the system that we have, right? Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in figuring out what that would be. And because of section two being an appropriations piece and adding a fiscal note component to this, I'd like us to have real information to determine how to meet the objectives that were mentioned relating to what is the proper dollar amount of income or is free and reduced the best way to address this bringing in input from all these groups um anecdotally i kind of have my own belief of where that would fall but that's just will's opinion that doesn't mean it's what's best so my question would be um this is just my idea so there's other committee members here you're the bill sponsor i want to accomplish as much towards your aim as possible and Without us, you know, the section two gives me pause. It says we're really not going to make any headway on this being an option until there's an appropriations discussion, correct? correct. So passing the bill is a great message, right? And that may be the current intent for us to tackle next session, potentially given the, the time of where we are. But if you as the bill sponsor would be amenable to considering us taking a, a the way the funding piece and just having the conversation determine how many schools want to opt in. You can create that through this legislation. We not provide any funding yet until you start seeing how many schools have opted in to provide this as an option. Mm -hmm. Um, But then still making sure that students understand that they need to pay because this is not specific to the SAT. It could be either, right, any of those specific types of tests. Is that something that would even be of interest to you to start that process? Certainly it is, it is of interest to me because I think the most important thing in the world is to do something. See, I've been around an awful long time and I was around when you had to drive to Savannah and I think I was in school a couple of years before the distinguished representative. So I'm used to going the distance, but what I am concerned about is that there's sometimes some little under the radar things that we kick down the road forever. Right. Because I'll tell you, like, like, like I'm, I'm, there are a hundred ways to say no and one to say yes. And you can't start to do anything until you say yes to something. Yes. And there, there are always reasons why we are. 
And this is just a little piece to help Georgia also become the greatest place to stay as well as do business. Agreed. So, you know, there are a lot of ways to say no. Okay. And unfortunately, many of the places that would hesitate the most have the worst scores. You know? I understand. Well, um, I see that Vice Chairman Irwin has arrived. So I am going to, if you'll let me finish this bill, then I'll hand it to you. Is that, are you okay with that as a process? Do you have another? Okay, then, <laughs> then perfect. All right, well, if you'll let us finish this one, we'll come to you next. So, so you as the bill sponsor, and this is not just my idea, we are a committee, so I want feedback and input from all folks. Um, if you would be a meaningful and legislative council could potentially, <laughs> he's a miracle worker, uh, this session especially, um, make this an option for schools to provide the testing in their facility as an opt-in for the school and an opt-in for the student. But currently, I think let's not tackle the section two and, and, and requiring the state to pay for it until we really need to know, to, until we know who needs it, who utilizes it, and then we can have a very good analysis to determine how, many, how we pay for it and what is the true need there. So now we, um, now my lights are lighting up. I, I'm, so. I'm, I'm amenable okay. to whatever it takes to make this work. See, I've learned after 20 years of being here, it doesn't bother me that it might not happen tomorrow. I understand. It does bother me if it's not going to happen at all. Okay. I want it all to right. happen and happen right and be good because, I, you know, I didn't come up here to pin how many bills I passed. I came up here to do the best for the citizens. Mm -hmm. Of yep. Georgia and yes, anything sir. that helps that succeed, I'm amenable to. All right. Um, so here's what I would suggest. Let me go. I've got five, four questions now. Um, did you see who went first? I was trying, okay. Okay. So what we'll do this. I think you were first. Um, so we'll go. Let's keep this quick because we do have four of the bills to go through. So go ahead. Yeah. Um, what I'd like to do is recommend that um, we suspend on this okay. and let uh, Representative Williams and Legislative Council okay. uh, put the language that you just said okay. in the bill and then bring it back up. I, okay. I'm not moving to table it, but I'm moving to suspend. Okay, we have a motion to suspend. There are other questions. So here's what I would like to do is briefly, the folks are asking questions would y'all be amenable to allowing that suspension and representative Williams as a bill sponsor to start that conversation with them? Or is your comment pertinent to information related to something other than a suspension on this bill? Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll allow it. Yes. Go ahead real quick. Okay. You're suggesting that the funding comes out. So how are they paid for now because I, I know that there is some funding somewhere and I don't know if it's coming from the state of Georgia where but aren't the tests currently being paid for somewhere in Georgia um, I believe and I, I would yield to my guess so the PSAT is paid for by the state okay so state allocation uh, the ACT or SAT is uh, some districts will pay for it out of their own budget and do it but for the most part uh, individuals the students themselves and the families would pay for it okay okay I, I just it's been a minute since kids were in school so since there is some funding so as since you're looking at uh, some amendments and i hope we're going to do those now because we've seen you all do that um but can you add in there the, for those districts that already provide the funding that that stays in there you so because i if i'm hearing you're suggesting not have any funding from the state pay for it but if it's already being paid for at the local level that there's not generated any additional costs. Yeah, I don't believe my comments or the other discussions would prohibit any individual school from using local dollars that they've already doing that. They can continue that. Yeah, Nothing. I just didn't want us to delay the bill because sure. we were having a conversation about money. Okay, perfect. All right. um, quickly, 25. Yep, that's me. Okay. Thank you, sir. I, I was just going to add, I think the idea of spend is good, but do we have anybody here? What, what does the school board should? association think of it what does page think of it yeah i think the people that are going to have to do it need to have a voice in this and i haven't heard anything from any of them 
Okay. Well, I've gotten some texts from those organizations since we've been up here. So um, here's what I would say is um, I really want to find a way to do something like you. I want to take a step to ensure that those students that, um, cause I remember the morning I had to go through the SAT and it was one of the roughest days of my family's life mm -hmm. out of something completely different, not just cause of me being their child, but something happened and it was, it was not a good day mm -hmm. and I didn't do my best and I had to do it again. So I, I, if, if we could have taken it at our school, whether it was a Saturday or during the week and pay for it out of pocket, it would have been much better than us having to drive the 45 miles we had to drive. Mm -hmm. So I'm very, very sensitive to that goal that you have. Um, but I agree with Chairman Nick. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be nice and let number 10 talk because I'm not going to cut anybody off. I think we're going to go and suspend and then you talk with this gentleman. And then if you would, I suggest you to speak with GSSA and GSBA. Will you raise your hands real quick? Those two gentlemen, I think, can provide you some really good information on the fly right now, if that's okay. But go ahead, Representative Evans. Yep. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, so I would just say when we when you're formulating this language, you know, I do think a big piece of, of school systems saying, yes, they'd want to do this is that they might if they know the state is paying for it, that might influence if they would want to offer this test in the in their schools. So I think that that is, you know, that so it's so even though the funding is considered and also I think if a school system is paying for it, I wouldn't want them to be penalized because they're paying for it. They were a leader in this and then not and then they, the state can't pay. So well, and I think to that point, you're yeah. kind of highlighting my concern and my you know, recognizing that we really don't have a good number yet mm -hmm. to know exactly what's the best way to pay for it and what's that cost going to be. Mm -hmm. And do we do it means tested or do we just make a decision? And that's a big policy mm -hmm. discussion worthy of discussion. But I think given the hour, we don't have quite enough time to do that, but I do want to see if there's a way to do a start. So with that, we have a motion to suspend. Do we have a second? second. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor of suspending? <clears throat> Aye. Aye. All right. Anybody, anybody opposed? All right. We're going to suspend representative Williams. If you would like to work with those folks real quickly, right. see if uh, you. you can come up with something and I'll call you back here a little bit. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. We're going to speed this up at this time. I would like representative <laughs> Irwin has a bill. And if you will let us know which bill number that is. Oh, uh, that is very true. Um, <laughs> all right. Which bill are we looking at, my friend? Uh, it's House Bill 1482, and the current uh, sub is LC490941S. All right. You may proceed. Can, can I ask a question, Mr. Chairman? Are yes. You, are we on a hard stop here? Have we checked that? We have, 3 o'clock. So and we've got... 3 o'clock is a hard stop? It's a hard stop, okay. yes, sir. That's what we needed to know. Um, with that, uh, considering here, I'm going to try very hard. If you read this bill and stayed awake, I'm going to pat you on the back and say, thank you. This is a capital outlay bill with the Department of Education had come to me in a situation. Uh, Pat Schofield is sitting next to me, which is, an, is the, the director of quite a bit for the DOE, one being transportation, the other being uh, what we would know as construction for schools, um, but he controls the capital outlay money that we um, allocate in our state budget. And uh, what we're trying to do is talk to you here about uh, uh, a type of capital outlay money that is currently in law, and that is low wealth and also project specific money. And this is for the low wealth districts to be able to access the state money that we allocate 
if they qualify to build a school, to renovate, to do things to their building. So that's what we're talking about in this bill. The first impetus of this bill is to open up a little more access, not opening up more money, but the ability to more access. I'm gonna give you an example in this bill, if you read it, the bottom 25%, um, Mr. Schofield, it's uh, about 44 school systems, I believe in the state would be the 44 low wealth districts that we're talking about. And they can access this money through an application process and through what they call a five years facility plan. So it's kind of mapped out in the state in the process and rule and, and how they go about to get this money. But this, uh, what we wanted to do was provide more access. So what we knew right off the bat, reading the law was that if you access that money, let's make an example that you have a 60 year old building and you need a new building and you have put in an application and you get $50 million from the state, you build yourself a new building. You then cannot access that money from that county again for 10 years. But you never came off the list of 44. So that means the 45th system, which has got a need too, and there always will be a 45th system. We're just trying to help out as many of the poor poorer systems as we can. So what we looked at and what this bill does is if you've accessed that money and can't touch it again for 10 years, you will come off of that list. And then you let somebody else slide on with the opportunity to get it, but only the next ones up is what I get to of what we'll call is your wealth area in the state. So in other words, if you're the richest, you would never qualify for this money. This is specifically designed for low wealth, okay? Then what else we did, the only other change you see in this bill was we, we put the words 35 years, that if you were going to tear down a state building that has state money in it, that it needed to be at least 35 years old. Ha having been involved in this a lot in my career, the materials that we use to build schools and have been using for quite some time now are built and put in place to be there way more than 35 years. I would say, in my opinion, a minimum of 45 years. In this money, as I told you, we also allow school systems to renovate, to keep the buildings up, starting at 10-year-old building. That would be heating, heating and air. We, we give them money to put new roofs on them. We get them money to do additions as they need to grow those buildings. So what I'm getting to is buildings should be around that we build today and for at least 35 years. So we, we made that change that if you were going to consolidate some schools and tear down and use state money, that that building needed to be 35 years old that you were tearing down. Um, that's a little bit of a long run, Mr. Chairman, into this. We could get more specific into the details, but I think it would be best then to try to answer questions to those details. Certainly. All right. We, we have a question online. Okay. All right. We've got two questions. I'm going to go with Representative Carter. Thank you. Um, so as we see, we, we get bills that uh, we, we understand they're uh, important. So first, how are these bills, how are the buildings currently financed? How is the ranking determined with the 25th lowest? And if the quote unquote wealthier districts will never get to apply, I can hear them screaming file. So help me, you know, kind of understand because how, how are they financed? How we create the rank is determined who's the lowest and how this is going to work. Good, very good questions, Representative. Um, what, what I'll tell you is the capital outlay money is for every system and it's based on need. Every single system in the state of Georgia, whether you're the wealthiest or the poorest system in the state, you have access. But then there are different parts of capital outlay. What we're specifically addressing here is low wealth, 
and project specific money, which is part of capital outlay, but that's only a small part of capital outlay. So there is money that the richer systems can uh, apply for and they do use it. Um, I, I don't know a school system that does not use or has not used capital outlay uh, money to build and construct their schools. Uh, but we needed, and years ago, our uh, legislature realized the need to target money for the systems that can't generate it any other way. So in other words, what I'm getting to, you're going to hear pretty quick that you can use your splosh dollars that systems have passed to do construction. So one ranking, I believe that Pat will tell us here is based on your sploshed collections. So if you raise the least amount of splosh money, you're going to hit the very top of the low wealth district in there. And so what's happening is we are then giving them an avenue to build because if their splosh only makes $200,000 a year over five years, they're going to raise a million dollars. They cannot construct a school for a million dollars. If they could not access this money, they would never in us through a splosh to be able to build it. There are other means to build a school. They could float a bond, which we all know, which can be very difficult and has to be timely too. Uh, but they, they, they have means by which they can, but the most common means are your splosh dollars and your capital outlay. And they do, some systems have enough money, they put local money into, into buildings a, as needed. So, um, I, I, uh, Representative Carr, did I, did I answer enough of those questions? So are you saying that the ranking is determined by how much slosh? Correct. Um, district can um, they they generate each month and they receive okay. a splash check and that what the the doe uses that in rule to rank these 44 systems okay. um and so yes and i'll tell you there the you know a, quite a few of these are not densely populated counties these are rural areas that uh don't have the opportunity to draw a splash penny from anybody you know so all right thank you very much um not to cut anybody off but to keep this thing moving quick we've got real quick 22 i think that's Representative Chokas. quickly please thank you mr chairman uh, a quick question about the uh demolition of the schools and this is only for those funded through your bill that's correct so if 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 uh, if, uh for an economic development opportunity came uh, to another that's not in the bottom 25%, that your, your, your 35 year moratorium on demolition would not apply. That is correct. It was 35. 35 year, thank Chairman you. Chairman Koch is 35, but um, that is correct. Only if there is state dollars in it that, that we provide through this program would that be affected. Thank and, you. And what I will also say to you is, uh, you know, many school systems, they, they do a five year plan and then they also have uh, enough generate quite a bit of splash dollars. They do their own additions, even though the, the state oversees it, the, the system is fully set free to make the decisions of what they do other as long as they meet rule like minimum square footage for a classroom, things, uh, you know, uh, ADA, things like that. It's up to the school system. This does not affect any of that. It okay. would, if you're calling this dollar down, that building needs to be 35 years old. All right, Thank and you. if uh, we can, I think this will be the last question, number 17. Thank you. This question is actually for Mr. Pat. Um, have you noticed at all if, the systems in rural areas versus a wealthier urban area, the knowledge of the administration to access the funds? I don't, I don't there may be a gap between the two, uh, between, you know, uh, metro areas and rural areas of the state. We have five consultants with the Department of Ed who are direct connection with those districts. And I, and I will applaud our staff. They're very, they're veteran folks. They've been with us. Two have been with us about 18 years and have developed superior relationships with their uh, school systems and leaders in the local districts. 
uh, our other consultants do an excellent job connecting uh, with needs, okay. identifying needs, working with those districts to develop their five-year facility plan. Thank you. Uh, yeah. All right. Thank you. Great, great, great question. Great answer to that. Uh, that the people that work for Pat are in the field. They are working with those folks, and they're developing those five-year plans. And and uh, it's very beneficial. This state. I would ask you if you have not drive across the line to some other states and look at their facilities compared to ours. That's the leadership in the plan we have in place to allow the construction to take place so our kids are sitting in the safest, best classroom. All right, thank you. Uh, number 13. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You, you kind of answered my question, but systems that are in highly dense areas where sale, sales tax is a lot stronger than uh, the rural area uh, you know, systems, is there a comparison on what the impact would be for those systems that do draw a lot of sales tax versus the systems that don't. And I understand what you were saying about the low uh, the wealth, your wealth systems, but does that mean that uh, the money will more than likely flow to the low the the counties that don't generate a lot of sales tax is it is that what it means this this bill means if i can get your question right representative i would say that um this program previous to any of these changes are definitely directed to the low wealth districts so right. what we have in place is money that they access and they're the only ones can access it. And, and it's two different types now, it's low wealth and project specific money. So uh, this money's already there. We're just allowing a little more access for this money um, by taking some off the list if they have received it after 10 years. And then we're just ensuring that we're not tearing down some perfectly good buildings with this money uh, there. Uh, I, I think, Pat, you go ahead, you, you say it. I just wanted to add to his comments, the regular capital outlay program and, and those systems who are accessing funds through their capital outlay need to meet their needs are not impacted by any of these changes okay. in 20-2-262. 262 is the capital outlay law, excuse okay. me, the low wealth law. 260 is the capital outlay law. Okay. In and it, it generates, that's what generates our, our capital outlay program and leads us and guides us is 20-2-260. Yeah, this will just ensure that the, the those folks that are in the bottom quartile will receive it quickly, not staying kind of sitting at that 45, 46, 47, if somebody that receives it during that, that period of time. So at this time, uh, I've got another uh, representative, Chokas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at this time, what I'd like to recommend is amend this to include one word. It's a friendly amendment, and it's on line 23. And in front of the word where it reads now 25% of local school systems to put eligible. So it'd be 25% of eligible local school systems. And that is... Um, I'm going to turn it over to Legislative Council to explain that. Thank you, Chairman Chokas. If I understand the author's intent, the uh, idea of the new subsection D1 is to provide for that 10-year disqualification period. If you do not include eligible on line 23, your bottom quartile will remain static. Gotcha. But if you make it eligible then those schools that have been school systems that have been disqualified are not eligible for that period of time and therefore would not be included in that ranking at you um you want to say just just to carry over on legislative council i want to be very clear this doesn't punish any school system they are not eligible once we satisfy that the needs are satisfied through the program i can give examples Calhoun County has just built a K-12 facility in Edison, I believe. El Edison, Georgia. Been there. Been a few times. Okay, I want to remember, remember the county seat. 
Uh, so you have Calhoun County who has just built a K-12 facility for 10 years. They will not have eligible need. So the intent is to basically back them off the list until they may have needs again. And they would be placed back on the list after that 10 year period. Pulaski County, Jenkins County, Wilcox County, Clinch County, Seminole County. The capital outlay program has done a tremendous job to help local school districts. This change allows the system to, to help additional systems. Quicker access to capital. And All Mr. Right. Chairman, I'll, I'll say that uh, um, Chairman Chokas, uh, I'm glad his uh, brain power improved my bill. So I'm <laughs> very friendly to his uh, okay. amendment too. All right. Move. Okay. Be passed. All right. As, so, uh, amended. well, no, let's just take it as amended. Do pass first. Do pass first. Yeah. So, okay. Just, yeah. I move that. Uh, LC number. House, uh, yeah, House Substitute HB 1482 LC 490941S receive the do pass designation. All right. Do we have a second? All right. What's that now? It'll be a committee substitute as amended. Yeah. yeah, it's okay. Committee substitute. Committee substitute. Thank okay. You. All right. So we have a motion to pass. I think I heard a second. Yeah. Okay. We have a motion to second. All right. Now I can entertain any amendments. Can I ask my question before we go into amendments? Um, we voted. The amendment would be. Let me take the amendment and then I'll go to a question for one second. Okay. The amendment would be inserting the word eligible. Uh, on line 23 between bottom 25% of local school systems between of and local put eligible. Okay. All right. Thank you. So we have a motion to make an amendment to the committee substitute LC 0941S. Do we have a second on that amendment? Second. Second. We have a second on the amendment. Now, any, um, all of, uh, any discussion? Okay. I just, I want to, I just want to, I'm always want to be clear. So the purpose of this legislation is to remove a school system who has accessed the funds that are still on the list in the 10 year period or the 35 year period, whatever. 10 year period. And they're already removed from accessing the money. So we're not changing that. Once okay. they've gotten the money, they're off the, the money ability for 10 years. Gotcha. But what we're doing is they didn't come off the list. So the only thing we're doing is taking them off the list so that we can let a few more get on that list to access the money from it. Okay. So they couldn't touch the money after they've received it to build. Okay. And then would this, what if I heard you correctly, what it would allow uh, the next ranking Correct. based on the same criteria would then become eligible if if one system access that money one system comes off we could let one other system on right but and i understand that piece and the system that comes next falls in that same criteria of the splos collection correct thank you i'm clear now all right thank you very much any other discussion Got a question, um, Representative Evans? Where does it say 10 years in here? I didn't see that. Yeah, let's look at D1. I knew it was in D1. Let's, uh, uh, it's line 46. There you go. Yep. Thank you. Sure. All right, so we have a motion and a second on the amendment, uh, committee substitute, LC49094S. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, hearing none, bill passes. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, let me point out that the DOE worked very hard on this. Oh, well, they recognized. Well, hold on, I forgot. We've adopted the amendment. Sorry. Oh, forget me. All right, now we're going to take, I would entertain a, do, a motion for a due pass. Okay. Second. So, second online. All those in favor to pass the amended substitute. Show uh, show of hands all in favor. Any opposed? 
All right. Now you have an amended thank bill you, passed. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, the DOE recognized the problem. I'm, I'm not a problem. I'll take that back. An opportunity to help other systems. And that's exactly what this does. And I, I commend them on that and the effort that uh, Mr. Schofield does uh, for the state of Georgia every day. And uh, uh, this was not an easy one to think through and met on many times. Legislative Council helped out quite a bit, but I think ultimately we are gonna assist quite a few other systems with some important state dollars they could not access that they could now. So thank you for the opportunity and thank you for staying awake through the whole bit. Thank you very much. All right, now, you, this is the best part. Chairman Dubnik, come on up. <laughs> you get to take Dubnik's over. not here. I mean, uh, Chairman, <laughs> Vice Chairman Irwin. Leave. Vice Chairman Irwin, sorry. <laughs> About like the other day, the, the rules chairman called uh, Houston Gaines Matthew Gamble. So uh, it's, that, <laughs> it's that time of the session. If, there we go. If we can get everything put together here. And um, first of all, let me point out, I apologize being late. We were presenting another bill on public safety that uh, held me out of uh, getting here early. Um, I also know uh, the uh, Chairman Dubnik has some other um, obligations right at this time. Um, uh, Chairman Wade, thank you for for picking up and going. Um, what I'd like to do, uh, Representative Maynard, let's, uh, if we can, can we start with yours next, which is uh, House Bill 1474. And uh, we'll just continue the meeting then, I believe. Thank you, Chair. Please state your bill and uh, LC number for us or your and your resolution. Okay, this is LC 490744, and it is House Bill 1474. Yes, ma'am. And oh. this a bill that was brought, it's a department bill from the Department of Education, the Career Technical and Agricultural Education, Department and if Mr. Cardoza is here, if he can come up. I can. And I just wanted to say that Dr. Barbara Wall is the state director for CTAE, and CTAE is on the rise across Georgia with the need for skilled workers increasing. There are actually 17 career clusters right now in. The CTAE program, it starts at agriculture, architecture, hospitality, and it goes all the way down to transportation. This bill is simply to provide a minimum course of study in career readiness education for students in grades six through 12. And I would encourage you to look at lines 16 through 21. I just wanna point out that, um, this is going to give people the opportunity to participate in classroom instruction and training experiences focused on employability 
and career readiness skills, including but not limited to professionalism, problem solving and resiliency, effective communication, time management and efficiency, and collaboration, teamwork, leadership competencies in the workplace. What that all means is, um, and this is for grades six through 12, what that simply means is we have people that graduate from high school, but they do not have the soft skills needed um, to enter into the workforce. You have a handout in your packet, and this is a survey that was actually completed by CTAE, and they have some administrative survey results on one side. If you go to the other side, there are teacher survey results. And with their survey, 173 out of 175 administrators, they rated an eight or higher, saying that the importance of employability skills is needed. Administrators also said 84% of them that they would support that instruction within the schools. And I just wanna, if you turn over to the teacher side, 73% of teachers are interested in these training opportunities. And I am going to pass the microphone over to Mr. Cardoza. Thanks, Rip. Right. Hold on one second, okay, sure. Matt, if you would. Uh, I, I believe everybody on the committee knows you, but if you would introduce yourself to everybody. Sure. Matt Cardoza, uh, Georgia Department of Education, External Affairs. Um, we appreciate the bill. Uh, I think everybody certainly understands the importance of the soft skills primarily. And we have a lot of our students through the career pathways who are preparing for careers themselves. But that, that key component of soft skills is critical that our students can succeed once they get into those actual career fields. So um, we appreciate the bill and uh, are fully supportive. Okay. Okay. Representative Maynard, any, any other comments from you before we open this up for... Questions? Um, I would, yeah, open it up to questions. You ready? Yes. Okay, I, I believe Representative Carter, I believe you were the first up uh, that have you here. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Representative. Thank you, Ms. Cadoza. I absolutely agree that uh, the young people, some older people <laughs> need soft skills. I also know that there are some schools that currently provide this type of training. Uh, whether it's in the actual classroom day or in other uh, like evening or afternoons. So um, how does this differ than what is already being offered? Is this going to be mandated? Will it be part of a curriculum and how will it be paid for? Yeah, I think, um, as you said, many of our many of our school districts are already doing this through career pathways and this, uh, you know, the bill essentially is saying that it is a requirement if you're not doing it. So uh, I will say that many of them are doing that already. Um, we have a lot of great programs through our, you know, through 612 already um, that, that teach this. So it, it's really just putting the emphasis on that and ensuring that, uh, that it's being done. There's a lot of, um, it's Perkins funding for CTA that they can use for funding so we don't see a, a cost increase from the state level. Um, Next question, Representative Wade. Well, I don't really have a question. I appreciate um, Ms. Maynard, Representative Maynard carrying the bill. Um, at the appropriate time, I'm ready to make a motion. We, we got a few more questions, uh, Representative. Uh, let's go to the next one up, Rep Chairman Chokas. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Will this coursework, and I'm going to address both of y'all, uh, will this coursework um, be used towards credits, towards graduation? Will there be applied credits, or is this how is this going to work uh, for the student as far as his grades are concerned, his or her grades, and the credits necessary for graduation? So with the career pathway, students have to have those in order to graduate. So what this would do is require certain teaching, <clears throat> excuse me, certain teaching within those career pathways. So it wouldn't be um, as much the additional courses that would be new requirements as it is the, the, um, the particulars that have to be taught and those courses that kids already get credits for. Okay, thank you. Next up, uh, Representative Evans. 
Yes, thank you for the bill. So just to make sure I understand. So it's like, I remember when my kids went to school, they had to get Carnegie unit credits. So these would not be like Carnegie unit credits. You're saying that when they're taking their classes that the teachers need to be, I mean, they need to include this type of, type of instruction, but it's not a credit as he just said. <clears throat> right, so every student has to have a minimum of 23 units of credit to graduate. So right. part of the, the graduation requirements have career pathways that, that students would have. And so what's in here uh, would be, what could fall into some of those career pathways um, to get the credits towards, you know, fulfilling whatever those requirements are. And may I have a follow-up? Yes, ma'am. Um, so is this only for CTAE students? I mean, for career pathway students, or is it for college prep students too? Is it for every student or? All students have some pathway that they have to complete. Okay. So it, it would be- So for it's for all students. students. That's right. Okay, yeah, okay, thank you. Good point. I, I could just add that the people that go through their program, they actually get a seal on their diploma saying that they completed this program this pathway. So to that point, it would be in addition to your graduation requirements, CTA students or, or any students really, because you're completing a pathway would get a, they can get seals. There's various seals that students can get on their diploma that helps um, post-secondary or, or workforce, whatever they may be going on to after that, um, to know that they got something specialized. I'm sorry. So it depends on the pathway. So some of those pathways that I mentioned earlier, you know, agriculture is one, hospitality is one, energy, finance. So it just depends on which of the 17 pathways that they choose. Like, I mean, it wouldn't have the language from number A in, on their seal here well seals seals we are able to develop some of those um through the state board through the department of ed and, mm -hmm. and the state board so i think that would be an after the fact if this goes through this way that we could develop uh, for particular uh, employability skills or as professor Manor said it would fall into uh, one of the seals that they already would be getting through one of the 17 clusters My, my fingers aren't working to help you or me here. Uh, that, that's, that, that's it. We have an online question, um, Representative uh, Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is for Mr. Cardoza. I'm not sure, um, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes, we can. I'm not sure I understand the need for this. Why it's, we have CTAE in our schools already. What is the need for this legislation? I think again, mentioned earlier, it, it's really a, it's stressing the importance of, of the employability skills um, for kids. Um, so why not do a resolution instead? Mr. Cardoza? So as the bill author, I'll answer your question. Um, as right now, employability school, skills for children when they graduate, a lot of them do not have the soft skills to enter into the workforce. Right now, only some school districts, some schools are offering this. This bill will pretty much mandate that all schools will make sure that every single Georgia student that graduates will have these soft skill training. And I understand that, and that's not, that's not what I'm arguing, but Mr. Cardoza, can you give us some statistics maybe on how many schools are offering this and how many school systems are not? Mm -hmm. I think that would just help us understand why we need to put this mandate into law. I wish I could give you a particular number off the top of my head. I would, I would have to get that to you. And I know I need to do that quickly for, for this purpose, but um, a, a lot of our school districts are, are incorporating those within the current pathways. So um, I don't wanna uh, say a number cause I just don't know, but a, a lot do that already. Thank you. We'll push your button in a minute. We'll come to you. Other questions, uh, Representative Wilson? No, sir. Okay. 
Representative Wade, I, Wade, I believe you said you got an answer to some of that. Uh, yeah, I think I can help the bill author. And, and um, you know, this is slightly dated, but um, our school system went through the, the process when I was a school board chairman to do a career in college academy. So we got some data about lots of different pathways and components statewide in comparison as our research. So on about 2018, the number was roughly about 68, 69% of schools would probably have some component of what's here, but potentially up to a third of the schools did not have anything as specific as what this would do to prioritize what's outlined in the bill. Thus my willingness to be one of the co-sponsors of the legislation, just, just for reference. Thank you. Next question, uh, Representative Howard. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on line 36, 37, and 38, it, uh, it says the Department of Education shall make such instrumental resources and materials available to public schools and local school systems across the state. So is that leaving an open end for from the fiscal note side of it where school systems now can come in and request materials and resources to improve their program so right now the and i'll let mr cardoza answer as well right now the doe provides all of those resources so they already have the resources it's a matter of the teachers so if you look at um, the back of this survey where it says teacher survey results you know the one thing that is most interesting is if you look in the top right corner reasons teachers have not used these employability skill resources most of the time it's because it's unaware and it's unaware because it's not required so this will significantly bring down um, the amount of teachers that just don't realize that these resources are already available to them. So uh, that goes to my question that this seems like it's going to make teachers or put teachers in a position where they can request, do they request from the local school system or do they request from the state the funding if they need additional funding for materials or resources? They'll get it from the state and the state already has those resources and the teachers for some of the programs, they go online and they can go through the training process so they can then go into teaching that in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So it's it's already a system in place. It's a, how, how's the turnaround time on that? On um, a request for more resources? I would say many of our school districts have those resources. If if they needed a particular resource from, um, from DOE, um, we've developed a, we have a large library of of resources for school districts already. So the turnaround time should not be much uh, time at all, unless it is something that is very specific that we've not already addressed. No. Okay. All right, let me go to one last question and then we'll ask the will of the committee. Representative Carter. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'm going back to the question that I know that school systems already provided and you wanted to mandate it. Um, and I think I've been consistent with local control. Um, and I, and I, I'm trying to see where in the language and maybe I'm missing it, uh, exactly where it says that this will be mandated. Can you tell me which line that is on? I read back to this a couple of times. So it doesn't have the word mandate, but one second. Okay. So line 36, the Department of Education shall make these instructional resources and materials available to public schools and local school systems in the state. And let's see. And then line 22. Hold on. 
Okay, 26, instruction and training experience. No, hold on, I'm sorry. Okay. 27. Yes, on, on line 22. It looks like it's 22. We already yes. require that. That's in current, current code. So what, what this bill does is requires that more specific um, line on 24 about particular training experiences, employability, and career readiness skills. So we already are required um, to provide career education, which we do through through pathways. Um, okay, this so this breaks it down more specifically to okay. say, okay, now you shall pr provide instruction that meets these employability requirements. Okay, so basically we're we're kind of just playing with words: career education and career readiness education. Okay. And then provide the resources. That's yeah, and then shall on thirty four. Okay, and then it's basically will be incorporated in the career path that they're already in. Not like it's going to be like a special class or something. That's correct. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, I believe we're at a point here with no more questions. Um, what's the will of the committee, Representative Wade? Uh, I recommend do pass. Second. All right, we have due pass by Representative Wade and a second by Chairman Chokas. What's that? Yes, 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 yes. Um, all right, we're, we're House Bill 1474 LC 490744. I'm so happy for people that keep me straight <laughs> and make sure I don't make an error. So. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm happy for all the good questions that we've dug into here today. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. aye. All those opposed, same sign. Hearing none, your bill passes. Thank you, committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cardoza. We're gonna go back. Um, uh, we're we're going, Honorable Al Williams. We're going to ask you back to come back up. It, we suspended your bill a minute ago. I would like to point out to the committee that uh, we passed a bill a few years ago that had to do with water buffalo. And when I was in the well, Al Williams called me, "Wow, Bill, Chris Irwin." <laughs> See, that's why you have to be careful what you say. <laughs> <laughs> While I was in the well. So while Bill Chris Irwin is uh, going to give the microphone uh, back to you, let, let, let's state everything uh, here again, Al. Let me look, our representative, let me look at your bill number um, that I've got it. It's House Bill 1184, correct? That's correct. And I believe we suspended and, and we've got an amendment, but can you read me that LC number again? 490727. Got it. Okay. okay. Um, just, you, you know, let me, let, let, since we suspended, would you come back with your talk to us at what you've done since then? Oh, met with the legislative council, and I'm certainly going to defer to him in just a minute to come up with the, the language we've come up with. And certainly we've talked with the um, school uh, superintendents association representative, uh, the executive director is here. And he is, as we speak, he's doing some polling and he does not see a problem based on the way the bill is presented. But uh, I'd like for legislative council to present what we have come up with. What's your, is your number 29? There we go. All right, thank you, Representative. And uh, Mr. Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if there were to be an amendment consistent with the comments that were made earlier, I would suggest that it would include the following. On line two, strike through require administration and insert in lieu thereof, provide for up to three administrations on lines nine and 10 strike through to provide that such requirement is contingent upon appropriations by the General Assembly on line 21 
strike through shall or delete shall and replace with may. Also on line 21, uh, strike through with state funding. And at the uh, near the end of line 21, before uh, the word A, insert up to three separate administrations of. On line 23, after participate, strike through the and insert each such. And then uh, strike all of lines 32 through 37. And on line 38, replace three with two. That's going to be a mouthful. That is a mouthful. I started out with a T-bone. I've ended up with some beef tips, but we're trying to cease it. <laughs> well, I see why you had uh, Mr. Walker do this. <laughs> All right. Um, we, we do have one question, uh, Representative Wade. Uh, real quick, just want to find out, did, did that also, when you change the word shall to may, does that incorporate the concept of allowing schools to opt in and students to opt in, to, or do we need to have separate language for On that? On line 21, the shall refers to uh, changing shall to may provides okay. for the opt-in for schools. Okay. On line 23, you've already got the opt-in for students, Good. Okay. where it refers to students who choose to participate. All right. Then that's so, it. Appropriate time, I'd like to make a motion uh, and then with a follow up to confirm that amendment. However, we need to do that. Okay. I do not see any more questions. So, uh, wait a minute. We do have a question. Um, Representative Evans. Thank you. I just wanted to ask about the up to three separate administrations, or is that a discussion point after, or is that a, that's what I would, I, I don't remember us talking about. Yeah, three that, times. That yeah. was the one I, I mentioned that the representative Benton had recommended. Oh, I came that in late. Limit, My apologies. Yes, I'm okay. sorry. That no, we that's limit my the fault. test to no. three times so as to not let, let it be done into infinity, but uh, to limit it to three. To so you limit it to three times. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. I did come. Okay. All right. Okay. With seeing uh, no more questions, uh, Representative Wade, what is your desire here? Do I not have you on? There we go. Sorry about that. I'd like to make a, a motion to do pass with consideration for the amendment discussed. So. Okay, we we have a uh, uh, we have a motion by Representative Wade and a second by Representative Carter. Um, yes. Again, I appreciate you very much. LC 490727 is the number we're working off of that is uh, in a, an amendment has been provided. Uh, Mr. Walker, um, should we take a, a vote? Or, or I guess my first question is, should I try to reiterate everything you just said that changed in this administration or can we provide that in writing? Uh, if if the committee and the chair uh, are uh, okay with it, uh, you would have my assurance that the committee substitute that would issue forth from that amendment will be consistent with what I just announced. I would be happy to either try to describe it or to do it again, but procedurally what you might entertain would be a motion to amend consistent with my previous announcement. Okay. Can you? I would like to make a motion to amend House Bill 1184, LC 490721, as Legislative Council has so aptly described throughout this bill. Okay, we and we have multiple timely seconds here uh, to that. Mr. Chairman. Uh, hearing no further discussion, all in favor of the amendment as Legislative Council has re just recently read to us, 
uh, say aye. 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 All opposed like sign. That carries. Yes. Now we've got to do the whole bill. Exactly. Um, boy, we are making sausage. <laughs> here, aren't we? Um, as we go, this is good bill. Very good bill, though. Glad, yeah. glad to see that uh, the effort of the committee and the, the, the person carrying the bill. So, uh, is there? I guess I don't see any further discussion. So I think we have uh, um, beat on this one pretty hard for a while. If I could, we will entertain the will of the committee. Okay. Uh, I, I hear a, uh, a move by Chokas and a second by Representative Howard. Uh, all in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, like sign. Bill passes unanimous. Thank you very kindly, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. After procedure with the sausage, I will forego dinner. <laughs> <laughs> it was a friendly sausage, uh, uh, but very good. Very good, Bill. All right. Let me look at our schedule and keep us moving. All right. Uh, Let's go to House Bill 1283. Uh, Representative Douglas, there you are. If you would come up to the podium. Yep. Thank you. This is an email from my grandmother that she just sent in the other day. But I have about a thousand years since the time I started. Representative <laughs> Douglas, uh, thank you for bringing this bill before us. And uh, as a fellow Bulldogs, go dogs to you. And uh, the guy that normally sits in this seat uh, is one of those yellow jacket guys uh, very close here. So uh, I'm very comfortable that you're sitting there and I'm sitting here and to the, to the bill here. So if you would, uh, but re read your bill number and LC number to us, please. Okay, we're working off a of sub LC 490942S. Everybody has, okay. Okay, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, once again, I'm before you with this little small bill, but it should be very effective uh, uh, for our, our young kids. Um, just a little backstory. Uh, I have taken the time. Wait a minute. Stand by just one second till we can get get numbers here up and passed out. Just pause for a second. Yes, sir. Okay, I that one either that I see. I talked I to one. I talked to the, the chair and the vice chair and they maybe re scrambled this thing and uh talked to lead council and we was able to get this thing done uh in the nick of time. So I think I have the correct wording. If not, uh let council is gonna have to fix it. <laughs> but uh I think it's correct um wording now that uh we all agreed to and thank them for taking the time. I know this is a early time of everybody trying to get their bill done. And we've been in here pretty much a long time today. My bill is very simple. That's recess time for kids and uh, some 30 minutes and uh, let them uh, get their health back in order because, you know, in, in our today's society, we've, we've helped a lot of people this year with mental health in our state. We took care of all of the older people 
but we, we won't have anybody to run, run, run the state if we don't get this right in our youth. So we have to start there because uh, most of these kids are, are from environments or they get home, they can't get out and they only have pee once a day, once a week. And so this will allow them some extra time to uh, cut down on some disciplinary problems and uh, get them back in order. So I just passed out a little, um, a little article that I was emailed uh, by a mother. Uh, and I just, at your leisure, I just want you to know that this is on my heart and uh, we should take care of our future. And that's it. I'll stand for any questions, Mr. Chair. Absolutely. You do have some questions here. Um, let me start, if I can, with first up, Representative Carter. Oh, at the appropriate time, I'd like to move that we do pass. Okay. We, we have a few more questions. Good. All right. I, I believe next, uh, uh, Representative Maynard. I just wanted to say that I support the bill. I was in the subcommittee um, when he initially presented the bill. And one of the things that we talked about was how exercise actually decreases um, or increases um, endorphins <laughs> within your system to improve your mental health. And so the Georgia General Assembly is on a mission this year to increase mental health uh, within the state of Georgia. And as a physical therapist, um, I definitely support anything that makes your body better. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Chokas. Oh, good. Um, Representative, yes. would you entertain a friendly amendment on line 14 where it says for all students to insert all members of the General Assembly? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> A brain of uh, Chairman Chokes. We have one um, question online. Is that uh, Representative Wilson? It is, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. I just thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to uh, thank my friend and colleague, Representative Douglas, for his relentless pursuit on this incredibly uh, necessary and good bill. Um, I want to raise my coffee cup, which you can't really see, but uh, it says it says University of Georgia on it and say go dogs. Uh, and at the appropriate time, Mr. Chairman, I want to second my other colleague, Representative uh, Carter's motion. Thank you, Council. Got you. Absolutely. <laughs> just stand by for just a second here. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Let me do a little bit of a reading as I came in late on this one for a minute. Okay. Um, any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, what is the will of the committee? Second. We have a motion to pass and we have a second. Let me read the LC number. I'll tell you <laughs> what, I am blessed, aren't I? LC 490942S. I guess I'm predictable too. Um, with, with that, we have a motion and a second for this bill. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, like sign. We have one uh, no, but the bill passes. All right, Representative, thank you very much. Thank you, Committee. Mr. Mr. Chair. Mayor. Yes, ma'am. I love you. Everything you can to get this done. Every year I've been on this committee, 
We've had to vote on your bill. We got one more. I like you and everything. Thank you. Rep Representative Sains, uh, we are going to start the clock here in just a moment as we are passing out your bill, which is Bill 1554, yes, correct? Sir. Yes, sir. That's, that, that's what you have here before us um, to, today. Let me point out that it has been brought to my attention, and I know I, that my fellow Bulldog has left the room, but uh, our yellow jacket that runs this program is watching. And uh, so we got to be careful with our Georgia Tech talk. Okay. So just uh, has been brought to my attention. So can you get by? All right. Let's see if we can get to this one. And we have a hard stop, Representative Sainz. Yes, sir. And so uh, I, I'm not going to make any guarantees to you, but we'll see what we can get to today. I'll, if you would, go ahead and begin with stating what bill this is and your LC number. Yes, sir. We got LC uh, 339095 for House Bill 1554. Yes, sir. And uh, just for the committees, and I'll be very brief understanding you all have about 11 minutes. Um, the Georgia Student Health Survey was the background to this. Every school in the state of Georgia um, prior to co the COVID-19 pandemic administrated the Georgia Student Health Survey in middle and high schools with an optional opt out. Um, if a parent or student didn't feel comfortable taking that survey. The significance of, of that for this bill was that that survey, on, be, being able to be available on a local and consistent le level, allowed Georgia, specifically local um, collaboratives and local public health officials, to compete for federal funding that we compete with California, South Carolina, uh, Mississippi, et cetera, for specific, in the areas of uh, underage drug uh, prevention and suicide ideation, suicide risk prevention. Um, so some of those collaboratives have uh, come to me for schools who have opted out of the new optional survey um, that Department of Education provides schools to allow them to participate, saying they are now less competitive to take that survey. So House Bill um, 1554, as you see in lines 11 through uh, 21, talk about the core indicators measured that the uh, most federal sources, CDC and SAMHSA specifically um, for STOP Act funding and several others, request as measurements of student health and vitality to see where, first, where, what schools have uh, bigger problems than others to make sure we put those funds in the uh, highest need, but also to look at trends. So I talked to one indicator uh, specifically that got taken out was a 30 day uh, a perception or perception of peer use. So when you ask a student, is there a perception that your uh, peers are drinking alcohol and drugs? That's not measuring if they are or not, but that's measuring what perception they feel their peers are, which is an indicator on likelihood of drinking versus what's asked now, I believe, which is 30, only the 30 day use question, which only measures the current problem. That's about the summary of the bill that what it's trying to accomplish. Of course, working with the Department of Public Health and congruency with the Department of Education as our public health professionals. I understand the Department of Public Health has a youth uh, risk behavior survey, which is very similar. However, it's not conduct, uh, conducted in each um, school, it's, it's done through a sample size of the state, which is great for a statewide survey, but problematic if local um, uh, professionals are trying to reach data. Um, I've I, I'm assuming if there's time, Department of Education will 
talked, they have, uh, I've appreciated dialogue with them. There's indication that some parents um, prefer their students not to be opted into a survey, which is more than understandable. Um, I'll just highlight that the, the process prior to uh, when we went into COVID allowed them to opt out, but that opt out uh, system didn't put us in risk and in a weaker position to add, add to programs that strengthen our, our, the health of our students as a whole. Clarify for me, uh, yes, Representative, is, is this required then of each school or is this optional? The, the current, I, I, and I won't speak for the Department of Education, they might be better able to, to talk about what they've currently aligned, what um, is preferred by the, the public health uh, folks that have come asking for some uh, remedy is to have each school system participate because I'll highlight, even if a system were to say, Today we're not look. We don't have an issue. We're not looking for extra funds out of our tax, you know, out of our database to to address these kind of issues. The the reason the state had always done this on a statewide consistent level is because you need several years of track record and looking at indicators. Because maybe you're above the state average when it comes to 30 day use of alcohol, but if your average is going down by 15 percent over a three year period, there's a problem there that might make avail to extra particular programs. So that's the intention of having it school by school opt-in. And I'd say those schools that ha have less resources might be more inclined not to participate in an optional survey. So this was the Georgia Student Health Survey for the last more than last decade was a consistent, consistently done in each middle and high school from my understanding. And that would be the preference of the bill. Okay. And so what, again, let me, let me ask the question that can they opt in to this program? As it said, the bill doesn't particular, it does not have a specific yearly or requirement. It, it says for the department of education. So the bill itself does and I would highlight that we'd be in a better position if all schools participated, but I do not believe the bill requires um, for them to mandatory participate. I, I think that leaves it up to the department of education and department of public health. I think there's two things more that I need to ask. Um, survey questions, since they're not provided here, can you cover those survey questions? What, what, you know, how many, uh, sure. what subjects are they asking? Sure. I, the intention for it not to be provided in the bill is because I, I'm sure that the committee's aware that surveys are specifically uh, created to for statistical validity. So what we do put in the bill are the outcomes that we're trying to measure to allow some flexibility for that survey. I'd highlight that from one to, to uh, eight, uh, that those are the uh, core measures uh, up until eight that we wanna highlight, but to give the flexibility for those survey makers to, to create it in, in what's the most non-biased, non et cetera, at the time, because bias can change. And, and if you don't give them that flexibility, that could harm the validity of a survey like this. Um, but again, all data would be kept confidential. It's not to anyone's benefit for a student to feel that that would be trackable for that individual in any way, because that would invalidate the data um, uh, or possibly cause them to you know, voluntarily give false information um, is what I'd highlight. But it doesn't ask specifically. If you want an example of a, of a question that was asked in the Georgia Student Health Survey, it's over the past 30 days, um, have you consumed um, more than a, a sip of alcohol and a sip is indicated of you know, religious purposes or anything like that. So that would tell you how many students in a given school system are um, drinking alcohol underage. I'm assuming in these eight areas, we're looking at one or two questions in those areas. So we're looking at less than 20 questions on the survey. I would, I, again, leave that for the Department of Education to possibly answer. I, I believe the Georgia Student Health Survey was a, a decent amount of, of questions. I'd say under 50, but I don't want to lie to you. I don't have that survey in front of me. Um, I th this is much less information and detail that it wouldn't be more than what has been asked in prior years uh, based on compliance to the bill. Um, it wouldn't add to any surveys. These are the core indicators that were already being captured before. We are stacking up questions. We're only going to be able to, to get you very quickly if we can, um, because we are down to four minutes. Uh, um, let's go to the first one I saw blinking here. Is that Miss Maynard, Representative Maynard? Yes. 
Um, I'll be really quick. So thank you, Representative Sains, for asking me to be a co-signer on the bill. When I read the bill, one of the reasons why I did want to sign on to it, because it's amending Chapter 2A of Title 31 in relation to the Department of Public Health. And on line 11, it says the department, meaning the Department of Public Health in consultation with the Department of Education shall conduct or facilitate the conducting of the surveys. And so the DPH and the DOE will be the ones facilitating the surveys. And the other really important piece to this, the whole purpose of this bill is line 13, accessing applicable federal funds. So the NIH, like you said, SAMHSA, um, these federal agencies have money and dollars out there that we're currently just not able to have, I mean, able to access. And we need the data from the surveys in order to access the funds. I would highlight a great example in our, in Camden County school system, we had several youth suicide uh, deaths, unfortunately, not that those could individually be prevented, but four years prior, the system and uh, uh, community members looked at the middle school suicide risk ideation rate. Have you contemplating harm uh, for your, to yourself? And that was a key indicator that there was a problem. So even though the school might have not strategically asked to opt into a survey, that was a valuable tool that they could uh, utilize in addressing that, that issue. Okay, Let, let's go quickly. Uh, Chairman Benton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I had a question. Did, did we ever decide whether or not there was an opt-in or opt-out on this? Uh, the, and, and then I've got one other one, please. The bill itself, I don't believe, would mandate a an op, required a participation. I, I only said it, it, would, it would be to the benefit of full participation, okay. but the bill itself doesn't require it. Gotcha. The reason I, I'm concerned about surveys like this, especially in the middle school, because middle school students are very impressionable. And uh, we used to do these, this survey in the, the school that I taught in. And there was one year that we got to looking at the survey. And if, and if you looked at, if you, if you believed everything that was in the survey, we had a rampant drinking problem. Uh, the, the children were very promiscuous and they were smoking uh, everything. So I, I think maybe sometimes, especially middle school, they, they tend to exaggerate a lot on that stuff. I, and if it's just to bring money down, um that's one thing but uh parents want to if, if they're taking the survey parents want to know what the results of the survey was and so I, I that was the reason i was wanting to know about if it was an opt out or opt in thank you uh let, let we, we can take one more here representative wade we are out of time yeah. so let's be very quick please. real quick just um what age would this be limited to and i would i just think to me that's important i'm uh, my wife is an administrator middle school, and I tend to agree it, it is a tough issue. I'm empathetic, but that's important. And I also think um, you would have to allow for uh, parents and, and students to opt in before even being a part of any survey. I wouldn't want a student taking a survey. I don't want my daughter taking a survey I'm not aware of as a second grader. So those are my concerns. So um, I, I hate it, but I, I almost feel like there's more work that needs to be done in my opinion, as one legislator. I know we're, it's about three o'clock, so I can answer hey, that. What, what, what I'm going to do at this time, then, as we are out of time, um, you know, let, let, let's, let me just ask the will of the committee to table. We got to move to table. Do we have a second? second? We do have a second to table this one for more discussion. Um, do you have to do your job? I need to read out. Not on a table. I'm keeping Austin in, in check now. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the motion to table has uh, been seconded. All in favor, say aye. All opposed, like sign. And it will be tabled, Representative. Thank you, Thank you very much for this effort and go improve. And that'll finish so that we can let this next group come in and have these seats. Thank you for uh, being here today and for your, uh, your efforts.